Thank you for the opportunity to present our case today. And as Claire can attest to, this has been a case that has caused us much, of, much consternation over the recent months and even years. It's a case of a child who has been receiving treatment for her HIV, but we haven't been able to suppress her viremia. I'd like to first acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land, the Yagara and Tuubal people, and acknowledge the and pay my respects to elders past, present and future. So first of all, I'll speak about the case and then look at some causes for non-suppressible virus. And we are currently trying to get to the bottom of this and doing some investigations, which I can present at the end. So this is a case, and I'm sorry for the red circle that seems to have appeared on the slides here that wasn't on uh, my computer at home, but uh, <laughs> bear with that. But she's a seven-year-old girl who's local, born here in Brisbane, to an Australian father and a mother who was originally from Papua New Guinea. She had an unremarkable um, antenatal course, normal pregnancy, and normal infant period as well. And she presented to our hospital just across the river at 16 months of age, with uh, pneumonitis and was found to have CMV and also pneumocystis pneumonia at that point in time. So as part of her workup for having these um, infections at that age, we did HIV screening. And you can see the results here that she had um, an antigen antibody screen that was reactive and also a P24 um, antigen reactive, a high viral load, but a low CD4 count and a negative Western blot. So I thought at this point I'll open it to the first question, which is, with these results, what may be the most likely timing for her acquisition of HIV? And whilst you answer that, I'll ask the panel, what sort of tests are available in your settings to help determine the timing of acquisition and recency of acquisition? So maybe I can start. I think in South Africa, we usually um, use PCR, um, and we test at birth, so we have birth testing followed by 10 weeks and then progression down the line depending on how long the mother's breastfeeding for. Um, and we always do two tests, so we have quite a few issues with indeterminate tests. Um, so we always like to do two antigen-based tests, um, whether it be two PCR tests or a PCR and a viral load. Yeah, for Thailand, uh, very similar. Uh, we have the, to do the DNA PCR. Uh, depends on the risk of the infant that will get the HIV infection from mother. If the mother have virus uh, unsuppressed, we do the DNA PCR at birth, one month, two months, and four months, and then test again with anti HIV at uh, 18 to 24 months. But for the uh, if the mother have virus suppressed during the in labor, so we think that uh, the, the risk of mother-to-child transmission is quite low, so we perform the APSA at uh, one month and just four months, and then and the HIV at uh, 18 to 24 months. It's maybe just to say, I think we we all envious of the number of HIV tests that you managed to do on the same same patient. Uh, so many of us will not have that, you know, number of tests done. Uh, I think the main thing is, is really around, I think, in terms of the timing. Again, I think it's you know not only the test, but you know the timing in which these tests were done and the sequence in which is it's done. And, and certainly in terms of a birth PCR being positive, you know, that would in our setting really be indicative of a early in utero transmission, you know, versus, you know, either six week or 10 week PCR with the birth PCR being, you know, negative, we'll assume that it was either late perinatal transmission or a early postpartum transmission. So I think we, you know, without the number of tests that we've had, we've, we probably will do a just a guesstimate of when that transmission happened. And I should comment that in Australia, it's routine to have universal HIV serology in the antenatal period. And so her mother's HIV serology 
tested in the first trimester was negative. Um, so that is why the child at this point, um, until she presented with this opportunistic infection, hadn't had any HIV testing done because we'd had the universal screening of her mother's testing in utero. Um, and the most common um, answer was breast milk, and that's certainly what we feel was the most likely mode of acquisition too, somewhat due to the timing, like the fact that it was 16 months rather than earlier, but also due to those results, which showed that P24 antigen, sorry if I go back, um, the P24 antigen that was uh, still positive and the fact that her Western blot, which usually starts to become positive from about a month after, uh, after infection, that it was still negative. Interestingly, when we then tested her mother and father, who both um, tested positive, then her mother only had two bands positive on her Western blot, again suggesting relatively recent acquisition of the virus. So we commenced our child on a triple regime of lamivudine, abacavir, and lapinavir, ritonavir, calitra. And again, this speaks to the privilege we have of the amount of testing we can do, but every, um, every, positive, um, test, every positive new infection we can send for genotypic resistance testing. Um, and so this is what uh, happened. And we did in fact find that there was a K70E resistance mutation detected. And this uh, was associated with low level resistance to certain nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors. It's thought to be similar to the K65R mutation and similar to the K65R mutation could um, increase your AZT susceptibility. So my next question may be a little bit um, tricky, but I thought I would raise it to get your brains thinking at the end of the day. But would you, based on this genotypic resistance testing, switch the regime or not? So does the panel want to? I think previously we would have had nothing much to switch her to. I mean, you might want to substitute the um, a back of her with AZT, but that would be then you know, adding something else that you have to take by daily. But now, depending on her weight, you might want to optimize her to dolutegravir. Yeah. And so the child is now seven years old. So back, so um, <laughs> back at, at when she was 16 months of age, we actually uh, move on, if I can move the slide to see what you have said. Uh, will it go forward? Can you get the responses? Oh, OK. <laughs> uh, no, no. I won't give away the answer, but really okay, there's... So we'll give you a, a minute. Oh. And there's no right answer would be the um. <laughs> <laughs> Such an even spread. <laughs> evenly split. Evenly split. And so we actually did what Lisa suggested um, uh, initially. Except as it, when I move it on again. Oops, sorry, now I've gone too far. As you can see from uh, from this slide, um, I haven't included her initial viral load um, taken because it was off the chart. But we've had her under our care now for almost seven years and made multiple changes to her regime, but never able, we've never been able to suppress her virus. She's always had detectable virus, sometimes peaking quite high, but often sitting in that sort of 1,000 to 2,000 level. And I can now show you that overlaid with the drugs that we have had her on, which are here. So we did the initial um, switch from abacavir to zidovudine and also added in raltagravir um, initially. And then when we've repeated her genetic resistance testing and we've not found the mutation again, we swapped her back to a regime which we thought might have been easier in terms of compliance. We've made multiple other modifications to try and aid the simplicity of her regime, a once daily regime, a, a, a tablet regime once she was able to swallow tablets. And despite all of those changes, like I said, we've not ever been able to suppress her virus. Interestingly, despite that, when she comes into your clinic, she bounds in carrying her latest 
doll or toy that she's got to show you. She's really well. She's doing mainstream schooling, grade two. She's got an entirely normal examination. She hasn't had any opportunistic infections. Her height and weight are tracking on the sort of 25th and 10th centile, respectively. And she's had a, a good CT, CD4 count, uh, about 2,000, 35% throughout. And so this hasn't been fitting with what we've seen from this viral load that we keep trying to suppress, but we've got a, a seven-year-old girl who's doing really well clinically and seems entirely unaffected by this. So this is potentially the um, most open-ended question and it should allow you, I'm not sure if I need to press on again, is it on your screen yet? But why... So can we open up the... Why may a child not be able to suppress HIV? So this is a mind map. It should <laughs> appear. I'm just not sure if I have to press it one more time. And I don't want to press it and give you away answers, but let's... Oh, at the same time, I was going to broach with the panel um, ways that you might want to discuss compliance with the family when you keep you know, providing what should be effective antiretroviral therapy and you keep having a viral load come back positive, how do you discuss compliance uh, and adherence with um, a child and their family? Anyone? <laughs> <laughs> Me again. Um, so I think uh, I will talk with the caregivers as well as the patient uh, about the correctness of the, the drug taking. Is there any missing dose or uh, the, the frequency of the drug that are taken? As well as has to check about the, the uh, drug, drug interaction, whether or not the, uh, this patient have uh, take another drugs or another supplementary food or vitamin that may have the drug interaction with uh, the, the drug regimens that they are taking, as well as check uh, about the, the, yeah, the drug, drug interaction yeah. is very important. Maybe just one other thing is just, again, you know, not to be overly judgmental and, and keeping it as open as possible so you don't close off the conversation. The other thing that I often do find is helpful is actually to go through the medication actually with the patient, with the actual medication, because there's endless amount of confusion when people bring things to you and you tell them, or they go home with something and they think this is what they need to do, but what they actually do is something completely different. So it does help just working through that, um, you know, with their actual medication to see what they're actually giving. So this is quite interesting. So looking at the 92 responses, thank you everyone for your involvement. Certainly we thought adherence and compliance would have been quite, um, we've moved on, sorry, uh, the issue and we really have worked really, really hard to try and assess her compliance and certainly we've had lots of conversations where we've tried to be non-judgmental and open and allow for an honest conversation and each time her mother's um, adamantly denied that she's ever missed any doses. And we've also um, investigated ways that we can co ensure this compliance too with directly observed therapy. We've done it on two occasions with a FaceTime dot. Initially it was a twice daily regime, so then we changed to a once daily regime so we could do every single administration video FaceTimed. We even got her in during the school holidays for two weeks so we could give her the medications in hospital. Um, we assessed all the things that, about whether there were other medications, milk, excessive milk, herbal supplements that might be affecting the absorption. She was swallowing the tablets. And again, this probably speaks to um, our privilege in terms of what's available, but we can even do some therapeutic drug monitoring. And when we tested her dolutegravir levels, so this was um, later on when she's got onto dolutegravir, and we found that her trough levels were actually two to three times higher than what's recommended. So certainly seems to be a child who is both taking the medication and absorbing the medication. We've since also done more genotypic resistance typing and not found any other genes of resistance. And I saw that that was something else that came up on the map about whether there was anything else from a resistance mutation point of view that might have affected the efficacy of her regime. 
And so with all of this, we've now got to the stage where we have a, a really well, healthy child taking her medications, but we know that she's still got virus there that we can detect. And as has been alluded to in earlier conversations and discussions, there is evidence uh, that that increases mortality over a lifetime if you can't suppress the virus. And we're not sure is what the virus that we're detecting in her blood actually live virus able to be replicated and therefore there's lots of implications for her and her future, whether she can transmit the virus. So we are really trying to get to the bottom of why we haven't been able to suppress her virus. And in doing so, we are now sort of working through three possible hypotheses. And I was hoping we'd have more results from the investigations that we're doing to be able to present to you today. But really, there's no right answer because we are still investigating these hypotheses. And one is the resistance mutations that we haven't been able to detect on our routine genotypic resistance screening. Another is that actually all the virus we're detecting is defective virus. And a third option is that it actually represents clonal expansion. And I'll talk about that in a little bit. But what we are trying to do is sequence every uh, entire virus, do full length sequencing of all her viruses to really be able to delineate which option and which hypothesis may be true. When we do this for resistance mutations, we'd obviously be expecting to find some resistance mutations that maybe are archived but might still be affecting her, um, the efficacy of her regime if we do full length sequencing of all her viruses. We know that from a defective virus point to view that often in this low level of viremia, what you can have is just defective virus that's actually not necessarily capable of replication, but that can still be detected on routine assays. And that can come um, from a clonal expansion. So a clonal expansion is when the HIV has been integrated into your cell's chromosome and then that HIV is not being replicated as such, but instead that T cell is expanding and as each daughter cell is produced, that HIV is then transcribed into the new cell and it in itself, the new cells are then producing either transmissible, actually live um, virus or it might still be just producing defective virus. So as we do our, our full length sequencing of all of the viral material in her blood sample, we should be able to tell if it's defective because then there'd be large deletions um, or is it from a T cell clone because if it is from all this clonal, T cell clonal proliferation, all of the viral, uh, viral proteins that we sequence should be identical. Reverse transcriptase is a really error prone process and so you'd expect then quite a lot of genetic variation when you do your full length sequencing. Whereas if it's from a T cell clonal proliferation, all of the sequences should be identical because you're relying on your actual host transcription. Unfortunately, like I said, I don't have the answer for you yet. And that's because when we've um, sampled the, uh, done the full length sequencing from her sample taken earlier this year, we've actually only found six full length viruses we've been able to sequence. This child has the subtype C, um, HIV one, and subtype B is the more common subtype in Australia. And so the primers used by the lab in Sydney who's helping us with this may have been optimized for the subtype B, and so they are now looking at their primers again to try and uh, repeat the sequencing and get more viruses because when she's got two or 3,000 copies per mil, we'd be expecting a lot more than six to be present. From what we have shown though, it looks like there are large deletions in the six we found, again, suggesting that it's probably not live virus and probably actually defective and not able to be transmitted. And three of the six are genetically identical, which may point to that clonal expansion Interestingly, we haven't detected any um, genes of resistance, which is reassuring. But like I said, the fact that we've only got six still means it's very early, and early days and we can't draw any conclusions from what we have at this stage. So in conclusion, we've got a very healthy seven-year-old child who despite highly active antiretroviral therapy and really good compliance and no genetic mutations of resistance we've been able to find except for the original K70OE that has got a non-suppressible virus. We're still investigating the cause for this and trying to get to the bottom of it will have implications for her in terms of 
how we can best manage it um, and the transmissibility of her virus and potentially also wider implications as all these investigations into low-level persistent viremia can help understand why um, HIV as a disease process and looking forward a cure as well. Thank you very much um, to the audience, but also acknowledging the London PVC Group who has provided a lot of assistance to this um, as we've worked through this, and Professor Sharon Lewin and Dr Sarah Palmer and their teams in Melbourne and Sydney who are helping us at the moment.